my name's Sarah Myhill. Um, I have, uh, I'm a, a doctor. Um, I worked for um, 20 years in NHS general practice. But for the last 15 years, I have um, been running my own practice in nutritional medicine. And the reason I've been doing that is because it became increasingly clear to me through my, my work as a GP that doctors were not asking the question why. They weren't looking for disease causation. And um, increasingly, Western medicine is all about symptom suppression with drugs. Now, in the short term, you relieve those symptoms, but in the long term, um, the underlying pathological process progresses. And the reason for that is we have symptoms for a very good reason. Symptoms protect us from ourselves. We suffer from fatigue because if we didn't suffer from, if we didn't experience fatigue, we'd work all day, all night, all day, all night, and we'd all be dead within two weeks because nobody has survived more than two weeks without sleep. The same is true of pain. If you have a damaged joint, it's painful. What should you do? You should rest it and look for methods of healing and repairing that. What do the doctors, the conventional doctors do? They give you pain killing drugs, which means you then use a joint that should be rested and you damage it more rapidly. And we, for example, there's some very good studies showing people taking anti-inflammatories come to their joint replacements, replacements sooner than if they weren't taking them. So. Um, when you start asking the question why, medicine suddenly gets much more interesting. It's like a detective story, and that's how it should be. We should be looking at the clues, asking the questions, doing the tests, and trying to identify the underlying issues. Now, the trouble is, that takes intellectual power and time. And the shameful thing is, most conventional doctors don't have either uh, these days. They, ex they make an excuse that they haven't got the time sorted out, but the fact of the matter is, they can't be bothered to think about it. And I know that why because I've worked for 20 years in NHS practice. And in fact, the reason I left um, uh, National Health Service is because I felt I didn't have the, um, um, I didn't have the um, facilities I needed to be a good doctor. There were certain tests I weren't allowed, allowed to do. There were certain uh, supplements I was not allowed to prescribe. And in fact, I had my wrist slapped because my prescribing budget was so low, that made me a bad doctor. So I um, uh, finished with the NHS and that then gave me the clinical freedoms to be what I consider to be a good doctor, to address the causation and, um, um, uh, and work from there. Now, nowhere has this been more important than the field of chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, fatigue is a symptom and um, which may have many causes and we have to ask the question why. And um, I started off in the field of allergy because Within the NHS, I was seeing patients with migraine, with irritable bowel syndrome, with arthritis, pushing them on elimination darts. Guess what? They did very well. Some of my chronic fatigue syndrome patients did very well when we eliminated um, certain foods from their diet. And, um, and that was really the starting point. But it didn't cure everybody, not by a long shot. I still had an awful lot of patients who weren't getting better by dint of doing a good elimination diet. And therefore I progressed from there. And um, the way I think about this illness, and I have summarized it in this book here. Um, 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 chronic fatigue syndrome and myalgic encephalitis. It's mitochondria, not hypochondria. What I have also learned is that, you know, of course, when you're young, you think you can heal the world. And now I know, guess what? I can't, it's taken me 35 years to work that out, but hey-ho. Um, so what I have to do is I have to give people um, uh, the rules of the game and the tools of the trade so they can do it themselves. And this is what I've tried to do with this book. There's very little in this book um, for which you need doctor input. Most of what is in there, you can do yourself. And, um, uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that is the aim of that book and indeed all subsequent books. I've written other books on uh, diabetes. I'm developing one on infectious disease at the moment. But I have to give people the tools they need to do it themselves. In thinking about chronic fatigue syndrome, I think of what I call the Mr. Micawber equation, and I'm sure you all know um, Mr. Micawber, the character um, in um, um, uh, Charles Dickens, and his famous uh, line was, income 20 shillings, outgoing 21 shillings, result misery. You know, income 20 shillings, outgoings 19 shillings, result happiness. And in fact, I always think that you know, health is very much like you know, money, you know, you don't know you've got it until you've lost it. And, um, and I, if you think of chronic fatigue in these terms, then that gives us the outline of, of, of the strategy of how to treat it. So income, we're looking at energy delivery mechanisms. 
and then outgoings we're looking at how the body spends energy and so let's start with energy delivery mechanisms first and a very useful analogy that I use all the time and guess what my patients can get their heads around this very quickly is to think of the body as a car and actually we are a sort of you know we're a, we're, we're a process we're a machine and um, what do you need to get your car to go well first of all you need the right fuel in the tank if I put petrol in my diesel car guess what it doesn't go and I probably spend more time talking about diet and what you eat than all other subjects put together and in fact I've written another two books on that my diabetes book which is all about sugars and carbohydrates and I'm just about to publish a cookbook so the diabetes book gives us the why we've got to do these things and the cookbook gives us the how you know what you actually put in your mouth but the point is there's only one person that can put food in your mouth and that's you it's something you have complete control of your diet now it might not be easy you know it's hard work you know changing the habits of a lifetime but as I very cruelly say to my patients you know my job is to get you well not to entertain you so I talk a lot about diet and that is the fuel that goes in in, in, the, in, in the car and then we have to talk about the engine and this was um, um, I, something I learned a huge amount during you know, 2005, 2006, 2007 because um, I got a lot of patients doing the right diet, uh, correcting other bits and bobs and I had a group of patients with whom I was completely stuck, they weren't progressing. Now I work very closely with um, a wonderful biochemist called Dr John McLaren Howard and I was chatting with him and I said you know, thinking about the engine wise, the engine of every cell in the body, mitochondria, there's got to be a mitochondrial issue here. And I, you know, I just don't buy it that there's, there's no problem at all, which is what the, many of the conventional doctors were saying. So I said, I asked the difficult question. Well, I asked the easy question, John, I want mitochondrial function test. He did the, um, the amazing biochemistry and came up with such a test. And essentially this test looks at how the engine of our cars um, function. And it looks at our ability to generate ATP, which is the energy molecule. And the engines of the human car work exactly like the engines of a car. We take fuel, we burn it in the presence of oxygen to create energy. And once the engine of your car works, you can go fast, you can turn the lights on, you can beat the horn, you can listen to the radio, you can do all those things. Unless you've got that energy delivery, nothing is going to work. So John developed um, mitochondrial function tests, um, which he calls ATP profiles. Now, we, between myself and uh, Dr. Norman Booth, who's from um, Mansfield College, Oxford, he's a physicist, we developed a way of scoring these tests, which effectively gives us an objective measure of fatigue. Now, this is so important because this is the first test that's ever been developed anywhere in the world that gives us an objective measure of energy delivery mechanisms. And I don't think people really realize that. And why, the reason that is so important is because if you have chronic fatigue syndrome and the powers that be say, you're not tired, you're just idle, you know, you're not trying hard enough, I can provide a test that says, no, actually, you know, this person's got an, an energy level which is only 30% of what it should be, 10% of what it should be, or whatever. And believe you me, some of the energy scores I see in the fatigue syndrome patients are dire. It's surprising they're alive at all. So um, um, having developed that test, um, we then took 71 patients that I had worked up already, did the mitochondrial function test for them, scored them clinically, scored them biochemically, and what was so fascinating is there's a very close correlation between the two. So um, that you know, put the mitochondrial function test right in the forefront of treating people with fatigue syndromes. Okay, and then coming back to the um, car analogy, so we've got the fuel in the tank, we've got the engine um, sorted, uh, we then have to look at the accelerator pedal of that car, and that is our thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland determines how fast mitochondria go. Interestingly, it doesn't just determine how fast mitochondria go, it determines the number of mitochondria. So it determines how fast the engine goes and also the size of the engine. And very often when I start people on thyroid supplements, um, they, their energy picks up straight away. But within time, with time, it gets better and better and better as I say, their engine gets larger. We then have the adrenal gland, which is the gearbox of our car. And the adrenal gland pours out the horm hormones in response to stress. We have the immediate hormonal response to stress, which is adrenaline. That's why athletes win Olympic medals at Olympic Games because, and break world records, because with all that adrenaline flowing, they perform you know, better than ever before. 
Um, then we have the short term, the medium term um, uh, stress hormone, which is cortisol, and then a longer term stress hormone, which is DHA. And there are tests we can do to measure that. Correction of that, supporting that is often very helpful. I talk a lot about sleep. Sleep is um, the healing and the repair. And you know, without a good night's sleep on a regular basis, um, people are never going to recover. Again, this is all stuff that you, know, you can do yourself. Um, and then we have the detoxification, which is the catalytic conversion. And I talk a lot about liver function and how we detox um, um, foods that we eat. And foods are toxic for two reasons. First of all, they're just toxic. Uh, there are lots of natural toxins within foods. If you look at life from the point of view of a plant, it doesn't want to be eaten. So yes, we get energy from eating food, but they're also full of, of natural toxins that the liver has to deal with. But a major problem, and again, this is a, a, a large area of interest, um, um, modern diets are high in sugars and carbohydrates. If we overwhelm our ability to digest those foods, that happens all too easily, they get fermented instead. When you ferment, what happens? You produce alcohol, delactate, hydrogen sulfide, all these nasty toxins that the liver has to deal with. In fact, the blood supply of the gut is really interesting because um, um, the blood that's coming from the gut, the venous blood, passes in the portal vein direct to the liver. So all the blood from the gut drains to the liver. If you put the contents of that portal vein directly into the systemic bloodstream, you'd go unconscious probably within a few hours because it is so toxic. So the liver does an incredible job and the liver uses a massive amount of energy. Again, something I'm often telling patients, at rest, the brain uses 20% of all our energy. That's why the symptom of foggy brain is so common. The heart uses about 7%. The liver uses 27%. It uses more energy than the heart and the brain put together. Why? It's cleaning up you know, the products of the toxic gut. That's why the diet is so important. If you're eating loads of carbs and junk foods, you'll be fermenting and you put a huge strain on the liver. So that's about as far as I get with an initial worker when patients come see me. And much of this is explained in detail in here. And um, this is all stuff that patients can do for themselves.